Greetings everyone and welcome to this mini lecture on fandoms. Uh, this mini lecture is going to take a look at this idea of fandoms, what are fans, what do they do, why are they worth studying, what do they have to do with popular culture. Uh, so we're going to just kind of take an introductory look at this. There's all sorts of great research and interesting looks at fandom. Uh, but we're going to just kind of hit the big pieces right now and hopefully as you get into this module be able to fill in some of the gaps. So, what is a fandom? Well, let's start with fan and define fan. Uh, it's understood as a noun, and we, in this context, we mean it as either an ardent admirer of a pop star, film, actor, football team, etc., a devotee of a sport, hobby, etc. So that doesn't necessarily say much. Uh, we do know that fan is is, you know, from the word fanatic and so it, it means you know when we see that idea of a devotee or an ardent admirer really somebody that's deeply invested in whatever it is they are a fan of uh, and I think this is important to look at and think about as we get into this idea of fan um, to understand that they are deeply invested and historically we have often undermined that idea of being a fan but the truth is lots of people are fans and some fans we value other fans we don't we value somebody that's a fan of Shakespeare we value somebody that's a fan of opera we don't value somebody that's a fan of Justin Bieber uh, and I think that there's something to be said about again that elitism that we see within mass culture theory of there are certain things you should be a fan of and there are certain things you shouldn't um, in what it means and, and kind of how all that plays together. Alright, so fandom as a subculture. Uh, Jonathan Fiske, a, a, a well-known popular culture scholar, uh, notes that fandom has been associated with the tastes of subordinate formations of people, particularly those disempowered by any combination of gender, age, race, and class. And so when we talk about fans, um, we're also often talking about people who in some way, shape, or form could be understood as disempowered. Uh, we typically, when we talk about fans, we often think of younger people, young people that are fans, um, and so they are in some ways disempowered from the culture at large because they're young. We see other people that are fans of things in part and that has something to do with both their class and race. If you look at rap music, uh, there's a large population of, of people that are fans of rap music that happens as a result or as in connection to their race and class that because the rap music speaks to them in their experience um, it's it's more targeted or it's it's more seen as authentic whatever we mean by authentic uh, so I think it's important to note that sometimes joining a fan joining a fandom or being part of a fandom may also be part of joining a subculture a culture uh, or a, a portion within the culture that feels they are somehow subordinate in some way to the culture at large um, and so part of the reasons, or part of the things that, that fandom does uh, as a subculture is it establishes a sense of ownership over favorite media texts. So all that means is that people see themselves as having some, again, investment, some ownership over a favorite media text. And so, you know, a classic example is, of course, comic book fans who will get very, very, or who can get, and I don't mean this universally, but there are, you know, there are people who I know that are comic fans, and to be honest, I'm a comic fan as well, but the people I know who are comic fans who are very, very specific and believe their investment in a particular comic, comic series, comic hero, trumps other people's uh, because they are not as devoted. Engage in interpretive acts with these texts. And this is actually pretty popular, and we see this done in a variety of ways across many different fandoms. We see this in sports when two people start to talk about their favorite teams and why one team is better than the other, right? We see this in, in Massachusetts a lot where, of course, the Red Sox and the Yankees, right, there's this, imp you know, there's this interpretive activity. Oh, no, no, Red Sox are better than Yankees. Yankees suck and, and things like that. That's an interpretive act. That is an attempt to own, you know, to, to exhibit some of that ownership and to be able to uh, look at these texts, and it sounds weird calling a team a text, right? How are the Red Sox a text? Well, to the audience, they are, because if you think about it, 
as an audience member, you don't actually, you do very little direct engaging. In other words, you, you do very little direct interaction with the Red Sox. You see them, you watch them perform, and their performance and how they play across the seasons and how you look at them as a team, that's what we mean by text. And fans develop a sense of self-identity for themselves, right? Through this text or through this um, through this fandom, they develop some of their own identity. It's how they start to identify. People identify themselves as sports fans, as comic fans, as TV show fans, right? I love this show, or people go, you know, go to great lengths to self-identify, including getting tattoos, right? How many people have you known to get things like a Red Sox tattoo? or a tattoo of some character that they really like, be it from a book, be it from a TV show, be it, be it a cartoon. So there is kind of a, a we see there's a continuum of fans, uh, or fandom. We start off with the consumer, and this is the person who potentially just, you know, consumes. He, he or she buys, he or she watches, um, but that's their level of activity. If asked, you know, they will say, yes, I watch that show, or no, I don't watch that show. Then we get to the enthusiast, and this is the person who will start to really talk about and seek out other people to talk about that particular fandom. Oh, you're a Justin Bieber fan? I'm a Justin Bieber fan, right? That kind of interaction. Then we get the fan, and the fan really starts to become almost an advocate of that particular popular culture. They're now, you know, constantly engaging with that fan, with that fandom, be it, you know, the sports team or be it um, the TV show. They're starting to really kind of cultivate other people or really try to, you know, you could almost say they're, to a certain degree, um, they go out and proselytize about that particular fandom. They do, a, you know, they often try to create community around that, whatever that fandom is. And then we have the producer, and the producer is the person that transcends, is the person that goes not just, you know, to get people to gallery, but will actually start to produce. And that can be trinkets related to popular culture. That can be blog posts. That can be, you know, fan fiction. That can be a variety of things. But they've gone to the next level. That Their investment in this fandom is so much that they're willing to cr spend creative time adding to it in whatever way that they can. Now there's two aspects of fandom. Um, the first is the social aspect, right? The piece of fandom where you get to meet and, and engage with other people. A uh, great example of that are, of course, going to sports games or going to co um, conventions, be it comic conventions, game conventions, uh, anime conventions. And then there's the interpretive aspect. And this is where fans begin to you know, either together or on their own, really actually interpret texts or interpret their particular fandom. And on the right here, I have a, just a, a screenshot of a film called Troops. Uh, and it's a very early Star Wars fan film. It's from the late 90s. And the whole idea is that it follows two stormtroopers through Star Wars, kind of like the show Cops does. So here you have to think about fans decided to interpret Star Wars and say, "Hey, what would it be like to be two star, you know, to be two stormtroopers in Star Wars?" And they created this 10-minute film that has gotten all sorts of attention and and you know has been seen millions of times. Y you know, YouTube only has listed right now about a little under 300,000, but it w has been on the internet since well before YouTube, and can be found in a variety of places across the internet. So these are two elements that you see predominantly when we get into fandoms. And you see it in a variety of ways. You know, the, the social aspect, you know, when you see people tailgating at a party. The interpretive aspect, you know, you get people that are starting to paint themselves uh, when they go to games or when they are starting to do things like fantasy, you know, fantasy leagues. All right, so fan communities, um, fans, fan activities are built around popular texts, right? And so again, I said texts are not necessarily just written stuff. Uh, texts are films, they are performances, they are anything that the fo fandom is a focus around. And so people, you know, within a fandom, you have activities around that. A great example, as I just said before, is tailgating or, you know, following a hashtag on Twitter around a particular event. Um, they read into text with great 
detail, right? So they really get into the nitty gritty of anything. You know, people will compare, oh, well, you know, Miley, Miley Cyrus's performance last time was better this time because this happened, um, and be able to really get into very fascinating discussions. To the non-fan person, it may not seem fascinating. You know, we, we, we sometimes will refer to it as geeking out. But what's fascinating about it is the degree, the nuance, the subtlety of debate and discussion. People get really into this. And I always bring this back to students and, and really emphasize that when they get into this, and everybody gets into it because we're all fans of something, um, their ability to analyze, to critique, it's fascinating. It's awesome. Um, and what they have to think about is, you know, when they're doing this, they are really doing a lot of things that are very academic. They're very nerdy. Um, and they should remember that they can do that as they come back to classes and, and have to do these kind of things in their classes as well. Um, fans debate these details, right? They get into these epic debates, you know, who's the best baseball player that ever played? Who's the, you know, who's stronger, the Hulk or the Thing? Um, they get into these debates and, and they use these details to, you know, validate or invalidate one another's arguments. And then fans integrate these cultural materials into their lives. They will wear things that tell them you know, that tell other people they're fans. They will try to illustrate in a variety of ways. They'll get bumper stickers. They will get, you know, they will draw certain icons associated with certain fans, or um, they will always make sure that, you know, they, they have their Harry Potter book with them. Uh, so they, there's a lot of ways in which fans actually build and develop their communities, and they use those material goods to communicate to one another. You're in the company of a fellow fan. And so fans also use coded language. The first is linguistic language. Uh, I'm sorry, the first is li linguistic code. And this is actually words being used um, to communicate to one another that you're in the know. So I have an example there of Team Jacob from the Twilight series, right? If you said to somebody, are you on Team Jacob or Team Edward, you're communicating, are you into Twilight? We see this with a variety of other places. Um, you know, are you a muggle? And if somebody says that to you, of course, they're talking, they're hinting at, they're giving reference to uh, the Harry Potter series. But then there's also symbolic codes. And symbolic codes, we, we throw around all sorts. We put them, you know, we have our dogs, as you can see from the picture here. We have our dogs wearing our, our symbolic codes. We're communicating to the world, oh, I'm a Yankees fan. Or we're communicating to the world, oh, I'm a this fan or I'm that fan. There are ways in which we can communicate that. Sometimes those are with icons on our body or on our bags. Sometimes it's our hats. Sometimes it's tattoos. Sometimes it's hand signals. Some, and of course, sometimes it's language as well, that linguistic code. All right, so fans as textual producers, right? Fans will often get into the point in which they are producing uh, elements within that fandom. So we see that some fans interpret text and others will go to the point of producing text. And what do we mean by productivity? Um, usually it entails a close reading of the primary text. So the great example I can think of is of course Harry Potter. There's been loads of fan fiction that has been made around Harry Potter. And the ways in which somebody is going to write fan fiction is they're first going to really study and get every, every last bit of details they can from the books, from the Harry Potter books, and anything else that J.K. Rowling has said about Harry Potter. Then, they're going to actually produce some kind of text. They're going to write something, they're going to tape something, they're going to animate something that is based upon that close reading, um, that takes, you know, their understanding of that, that world, that fandom, and take it in a new direction. And so this actually creates the opportunity to create brand new narratives, which of course is what ties so many fans into a fandom. Whether that fandom is music or sports or comics, we often are being pulled into these narratives, these stories, these, these connections with these people that are part of this fandom. So this includes fan fiction, fan films, and games. Um, Clothing, it's, you know, they, there's a variety of things that this includes. Um, and I would, imp I would encourage or I would emphasize that, that, you know, those fan games, that includes fantasy sports games. So if you have a, if you're part of a, 
a fantasy sports league, you're engaging in fandom. You're taking what's real, right? A close reading of the real text, the games, the players, and their stats, and you're creating something fictional out of that. You know, your own league and how they measure up to other people's leagues within this world. Um, so there's some fascinating, cool things that people do with fandoms. Um, some very fascinating and engaging rewards that we see. So other things to know um, about fandoms in general is, you know, we see a large concentration in science, fantasy, and horror, a large, fan a large concentration around comics, videos, and anime, um, but we also see a lot of fandoms in sports. We see a lot of fandoms, uh, fandoms in music, right? We have parrot heads for people that are a fan of Jimmy Buffett. Um, I, I'm sure there's some nicknames for, for people who follow, follow Justin Bieber. But we have those people that are, are considered fandoms, that follow or, you know, deeply invested in whatever it is that people are interested in. I can think of um, the show Glee, and you have Gleeks, right? These are people who are absolutely in love with and follow Glee passionately. You also have history, people that are fandoms of history. You know, they often call themselves hif history buffs and people who do reenactment uh, reenactment performances, right? Those people are fans. They are actually donning clothing and getting out there and trying to reenact what has already happened. So why do people join fandoms? Um, the first is what's, what's referred to as eustress or what we understand as positive stress, that it creates, it creates a, a positive stress in people's lives, a means of getting excited and, and getting ready for something that, that they enjoy. There's definitely an element of escapism, um, and that shouldn't be understood as derogatively because so much of what we engage in outside of our day-to-day -day routine has elements of escapism. You watch a TV show, you go to a comedy show, all of those have elements of escapism. So this isn't fa a fantastical escapism. This is just part of what humans do. They get into other narratives, and there's, there's rewards to that. Of course, entertainment group affiliation, right? You join a fandom and you therefore um, become part of a group. There's there's rewards in that. Self-esteem. I know this sounds crazy, but there's a lot of people who get into fandoms and they build their self-esteem because no longer are they left thinking they're the only ones that like this or they're the only ones that like that. They know there's other people that like it and people value them for also liking it. And that sense of belonging, knowing that there are other people who are invested in this as much or more than you are. And then the invo invest emotional investment without getting hurt. Um, you know, that this is, you can get into or very excited about these things. And there's nothing, there's potentially nothing negative that's going to hurt you, right? If you really get into Harry Potter, there's not necessarily something that's going to hurt you by getting into Harry Potter directly. Um, if you're into baseball, there's nothing evident about potentially getting hurt. And that's, that's valuable. Again, particularly as we look at when we said that a lot of these people interested come from places of, uh, places of subordinate groups, there's something important to be seen there. All right, that's all for now. Thank you very much for listening to this mini lecture on fandoms, and uh, I will see you in the next lecture. Thank you.